do you know what the purpose of these burn seminars is for? I mean, except for the weird ones like, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the New Jersey philosophy of uh, Bruce Springsteen. Some of, those, some of those things are really dumb. Uh, it's to give you a look over the horizon. Okay? You're gonna, some, sometime along about sophomore, junior year, you're going to get to that point of, what am I doing this for? Why am I torturing myself? What do I get out of it? This is trying to give you an idea of what you could get out of it. So if you can, you know, that, that what you're going to, AI is going to show up somewhere in what you're doing, so, uh, you know, when you get your job. So this is this, say, here's where you're headed. Maybe not in undergrad, but in grad school. You have lots of fun with AI. On the other hand, if this is what you think you have to learn, and you're right, okay? Just not this, not this semester. <laughs> right? Is that what you want to do? This is called machine learning, a probabilistic approach. So you have to have all the discrete math, all the continuous math, you have all the statistics, all the probability that's behind the statistics. Tons of stuff. However, a lot of the basic problems are not all that difficult. If you want to solve them formally, mathematically, it can be very difficult. So the question is... He sings a lot this way. How do you want to do it? Okay. I also dance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You will discover that he's the philosopher. I'm the engineer. Right. Okay. I'm, I'm the. Here it is. I'm the engineer, and he's like saying, "Well, yes." You're, you're, you're a CS degree, right? Yeah, I, I have an engineering degree, but I realize that if I continued in engineering, I would commit suicide. <laughs> I was at the Yale University. Uh, so I current. Uh, machines lab. It was before they pulled them out. And if you connect the wrong wires with direct current machines, boom! That's it. So, you know, I knew that I had to stay with low powered machines like computers. Otherwise, that was it. This is a book by Eric Kandel, famous neuroscientist, uh, winner of the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine who is doing some of the most advanced work on real neural nets as opposed to the fake neural nets in so-called deep learning and machine learning. Notice the title of his book. What unusual brains tell us about ourselves? The disordered mind, right? Now, when you guys do computer science, it's all about ordering stuff. The interesting thing about us, which accounts for a lot of our creativity, Disordered mind, but not completely. We're getting yeah. to get an idea. There, there right. is some, for example, or some uh, indication that uh, some forms of, of uh, autism are actually what the great writers had and the great thinkers had, that they were not normal mm -hmm. in ways that might be misdiagnosed as being bad. But we don't know. I'm going to do a natural language parser and also try to try and understand what the text that you're given is about. That's it. Natural and language understanding together with image understanding. Uh, two big things that are going to be required to make the next leap ahead in AI. And natural understanding, natural language understanding right now is very primitive, despite what you may hear and what you may see. Okay, so with any luck, you'll learn enough here to understand where the opportunities are right. for actually working. As, as the philosopher says, you learn enough to know what you don't know. Anyway, so, today, if we go fast, we have, what are the definitions of AI? What aren't the definitions of AI? What, uh, what are AI techniques? We won't talk about that much this time. Uh, how, this, this stuff, robot, we will talk about, the dreaded project, pseudocode we'll probably get to, pizza. I'm allowed to get two days worth of pizza, like three or four slices each, twice in the semester. You need, uh, we're going to ask you what day of what class. Okay. It's always fun to have free pizza. Yeah. 3.30 in the afternoon. I like it. Great. All right. So what are the definitions of AI? You all heard of the Turing test? I heard about that last time. What? I heard about in my last class we talked about capture. Talk about what? We're talking about capture, and it came up in my last class. Capture, cap like the 
CapCut. Who you're not a robot and you like sign up for like a social media or something like that. Oh, okay. CapCut. Yeah. CapCut. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, 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 okay. Cap-cut. Sorry. Cap-cut. 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 I, I didn't recognize the word. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, the Turing test was invented by a guy named, named Alan Turing, who in the 50s and 40s was a uh, very influential figure in the ideas, but not the actual parts of artificial intelligence. And his idea was that if you could get a program that would recognize, recognize, talk, uh, it could be typed, uh, natural sentences, and could respond with natural sentences so that the person typing would not know if it was a human or not, then that would be artificial intelligence. Nowadays, we know that that's just ridiculous. <laughs> Everybody says the Turing test is, artific- is artificial intelligence. Because how, if that's true or not, depends on the person doing the typing. You know, how sophisticated am I? How sophisticated a, a conversation do I? If I have a conversation about rocket science or about you know some television show about Breaking Bad, I'm going to get two different sets of responses, and I may rec- I may decide that, that this is you know this passes the Turing test and that one doesn't. So it's it's too too wide a uh, a field. So so the Turing test is just not. You've all heard how AI is going to solve all our problems as well as kill us, right? That's the two extreme views of AI right now. And there's a bit of truth to both of them. Uh, incredible advances in the last 10, 15 years. At the same time, if you compare AIs to us, NIs, right? Natural intelligences. All that machines are doing is very cleverly programmed, meaningless manipulation of symbols which is what we all do in mathematics and logic. If you think of it for a moment, juggling symbols in itself without us giving it meaning is meaningless. It's like algebra, right? X squared plus you need, y squared. You need a human in the loop. No human in the loop, meaningless. Now, a lot of people like Kurzweil, who made tons of money and became a pseudo-philosopher and wrote a book called In the Age of the Spiritual Machines, Total nonsense. Okay. We need that. We need another. We need another course to discuss why. But anyway, as far as I'm concerned, whether putting on my engineering hat right there or my philosopher's hat, either way, total nonsense. Okay. No, no body, no no biological body in any of our wonderful machines here. No emotion, no spirit, no nothing. Other than meaningless juggling of symbols. This may sound like we're telling you that we can't teach you anything. That's not true. No. We can teach you Eventually we will. And if you really what we want to tell you is what it ain't. Too, but we won't. This course is not for that. This course is to try to help you figure out what makes sense and what is, what's hype and what's hope with artificial intelligence. Okay? okay? That's where, where, where will you, I mean, by the time you guys graduate, a lot of the, the junk stuff will uh, be evaporated. We hope. And, Roger. And, so you'll be working on the real stuff. And so that's, where, that's what we're trying to get at. So this is a, a quote from a guy named Michael Crichton, who was an author and died recently. And he talks about, and as I call this, meteorology of the empty promise. And we'll, talk, and we'll show a little bit of a couple of graphs of Hurricane Dorian and how useless they are. Um, earthquakes are continuous, a half a million a year, three every minute. Richter 5 every six hours, major quake every three weeks. There's a quake the size of Pakistan every eight months. At any moment on our planet, 11 lightning strikes every second. 1,500 lightning storms on our planet at any given moment. A tornado touches down every six hours. A tidal wave every three months. 90 hurricanes a year, one every four days. Okay. With this much chaos, can we really use AI techniques to model model the atmosphere? Well, it turns out at least not yet. Okay. This is, these are the tracks of uh, every hurricane from, I think, 1850, okay? That's the actual track. These are the actual tracks of hurricanes around Florida. Notice that this one goes, hey, and this one goes up here and comes, uh, comes back. So this is, uh, that's Dorian. That's Dorian, okay? This distance, it's about 650 miles. So how useful is this? Not much. 
Okay, but this is the best they can do. This is the very best. So can we learn anything from this? No. Not really, because well, well, here's something to go off over here. Here's something to go to Nebraska. What Charles means. What? Can you learn something specific? Yes. If we learn it in general. Can I can I get something out of this that will tell me what the, where the next hurricane is going to go? No, not yet. Okay, we can't really learn anything from this because it's too idiosyncratic. And in fact, for the most case, we don't know enough because it turns out now we know that one of the things that affects a hurricane path is other weather. For example, with Dorian, there's a high pressure system on either side of it, which is why it didn't just slam right into to, uh, Florida and turn northeast. Okay, there's we don't know enough just looking at these tracks to tell us anything useful. All right, and there's uh, this is the Dorian one. Okay, so here these are the models. It's okay. This one said, oh, it's just going to go straight across Florida. Right. These say it's going to go here, but look, it's going to go into Central North Carolina or Central South Carolina or straight at Bermuda. This is the best that they can do so far. Maybe one is correct, maybe not. All right. So, so they, the claim is that, oh, this is all AI. We got it all done. Ha ha. No, we have. The big problem with AI is the same problem that all humans have. We tend to overgeneralize. If you think of it, the reason people kill each other is that we label each other wrong, and we decide you're an enemy rather than a friend. And enemy and friend is not a sufficiently adequate specific label. Maybe specific for a specific problem. So what you saw there with the wide path in the hurricane, that's what you can predict ahead of time. You cannot predict whether it's going to be your friend or your enemy as a hurricane, right? Friend being the hurricane that goes elsewhere and doesn't come near you. Enemy the one that hits you, like the poor people in the northern North Bahamas Islands, which have been totally destroyed. You know, so that's philosophy. Yeah. Okay. What part of this is can be chosen to be could be thought to be correct? Right there. That's about it. That's where it is. That's where it was right then. Everything else was just guesswork. All right, gaming. All right, I like that. Gaming. Actually, I'm sure you've all played computer games of a variety of types. That's actually they're actually doing pretty well. But, it's a, but the thing to remember is it's, it's a very narrow range of, of intelligence. Basically, where can I go to shoot the bad guy or the human? Okay, so it's a very narrow range, and they do a pretty good job of at least modeling a psychopath. Basically, everybody you go up against that's a non-player character, and maybe some players, it's a psychopath trying to kill you. That's it. And so you, that, its, its motions are easy. And you're and you're you have the hard part, but how they're going to react is easy. But it is still intelligence of a sort. Planning and pathfinding, GPS, turn by turn, that kind of stuff. Follow the GPS into the ocean. You know why? Because the, what? Does it to me to look at the phone or not? The well, no, no, but I, well, yes. I mean, yes, that's true. But I mean, why did the GPS do this? It's location. It's not exact location. No, it is actually. What was the other person? Oh, would you? Yeah. No, okay. Now, this is exactly where it's supposed to be. Turns out this is where a ferry docks. So the GPS expected you to get on a ferry boat and go somewhere, but didn't tell you that. It just, the path just said, go here, and then it'll go, and so it says, you know, go out into the water. And they didn't look that far, and they didn't recognize that it was a ferry, so they just drove right into the ocean. I had an episode this summer when I was over in Poland with my uh, wife's family. And this little nephew of, I guess, 11 or 12 years old, he just got a GPS. Mm -hmm. They were going, riding the bicycle through the fields and over the levees, you know, an area of floods. And we were quite far away, and it was going to get dark. And we didn't have lights on our bicycles, so it was not a good idea. We could have fallen into a river or got run over by a car or whatever. So I said, let's cut through the fields. He said, no, no, my GPS says you have to go all the way around like this. I said, yeah, that's because it's telling you where the roads are. I know how to cut through the fields. Even though I'd only been there to that place twice before, he's lived there all his life, he has succumbed to the problem of being allowing yourself to be guided by AI, which is limited. Namely, it sees the whole world as, as a network of... All it has was paved roads. 
Who okay. cares about paved roads or, when you're in the middle of a country? You can do this rather than this, right? And according to the GPS you would use, like, the ferry boat was just another road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so its artificial intelligence was correct, sort of, but she over relied on it and. Hello. Okay. Image analysis. All right. It's a little hard to make out, but. This was uh, an example I came up with. Okay, so this is an image analysis of this scene. And there's a fella sitting there, and there's a, this and that. Now, this is a gray elephant doll that was added to the scene. Basically, they just have it from the ceiling. And all of a sudden, this becomes a chair. Some of these things, whatever was over here, let's see, where is it? That, uh, this changes into something else. This disappears and, and becomes something else. The person disappears entirely to the image analysis. Okay? That's because the image analysis makes really bad assumptions about pattern. Okay. And the worst part is we don't know what assumptions it's making. Because the whole idea behind the power of neural nets today yeah. is that they can do incredible things efficiently computationally according to their algorithms but their algorithms are not predictable. They mish and mush all kinds of patches of images, features that are aggregated in different ways. Our virtue of being humans and animals' virtues of being animals is four million years of evolution for us and more for certain animals. We know what we are focusing on, right? And we develop gradually as children until you know our we, age. We, know, we see what our trillions our silly, and trillions of images. We see what, what we see yeah. what are silly solutions and yeah. know to ignore them. So the fact that there's an elephant in the room shouldn't change anything, but it sure does. And you might have heard of you might have heard of uh, people saying that uh, we don't know how this works, but it works really well. Okay, that's a really bad place to be. It works very well to make lots of money for people who have been pushing it, okay? That's what it works very well for. Other than that, eh, we're not so sure. And if they're honest, they would tell you they're not so sure either. So science, it ain't. Definitely yeah. not. It's, it's statistical it's, mumbo -jumbo. Well, it's, it's juggling, it's early stages juggling engineering. Like the first trains that used to fall off bridges because they didn't, hadn't figured things out, or smashing into stations and such like that. It's going to take a while. Yeah, you guys are the ones who are going to make it work. For real. As opposed to this, oh, I've got a stock option for this company, so I'm going to claim that such and such is true when it ain't. Right. That's, on, you know, that's, that's a whole other subject. All AI is gambling, by the way. You could say overgeneralizing. All of life is a giant casino, right? It is, if you think of it. Except we have four million years of evolution to try to figure out how to avoid being cheated by the house, because casinos guarantee that they cheat you, right? But they tell you that ahead of time when you walk through the door. The AI house. is not telling you that quite yet. That's the problem. That's the Anybody do robotics in high school? Many, okay. What'd you do? I did uh, first robotics, so I oh. built, we built... Uh, robots that found paths around objects automatically and that we tried to use a neural net for that but it failed didn't miserably, work. Didn't it? It, it, it failed miserably yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it wouldn't detect objects it right. would think yeah. objects are part of the background and then it kept right. on right there is no model that's the thing right no causality how about you the thing oh, also did first oh, okay right. and there was somebody what? yeah you i did the lego like robots oh okay. they like the they had like light sensors touch sensors yeah yeah i know sensors. we have some of those downstairs yeah, so we did that. So we had like, depending on what the pro problem was, it used like one of the sensors. Oh, okay, so you had multiple it. problems. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, the, uh, the Lego Mindstorms, that's the one, right? Yeah. Yeah, those are actually very nice little systems. The, uh, there's, a, there's a company that makes an add-on board so you can use real cameras and real sensors and so forth. And, it's, and since it's a really good computing engine inside, you can make use of it. It's really interesting. Anyway, so this is a, a robot. <laughs> And then you see that one right there. Back into the air. And then one of these one kind of looks like a cheetah if you've seen one of the cheetahs in movies, right? Alright, well, we'll see, see them in the zoo occasionally. So this is, this is, this is really great. Yeah. And this is the video.
video they will show you if you want, if they want you to, you know, help them spin off a company. But they're coming up at the end, they say, won't show Yeah. We <laughs> all that's you or me, every three votes or something, right? Okay, that's funny. It was, do you know where that was done? Who filmed it? Do you recognize the buildings behind it? Hmm? I'm guessing it's either Columbia or MIT. I think it's MIT. But it could be MIT, yeah. They have buildings that look like that profile. But you see, you have to have seen enough of it. To, to really know what building it is, right? This doesn't look too bad. And there's no, there's no failure one of these. But, uh, so I mean, so, so you can do that now. This would really impress it, okay? So this is on snow, which at least in theory is going to be eh, kind of iffy. And also, you can't tell what's underneath it. I'm sure they, there, see? Ah, see? And it handled it. So this this guy this thing is running a whole bunch of models of what's happening there. See that? That was not good. That, 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 see? And it can recover because it's got enough smarts to recognize failure. So it recognizes, for example, that its center of gravity has shifted. And so it has a, a, a series of uh, recovery items. And I think this has that, yeah. So. A lot of venture capitalists with billions of dollars to spare probably threw money at this uh, after seeing this movie, right? And well, this is Boston Dynamics who has a ton of money, so probably. Yeah, they do good work. Yeah. This one's interesting. Yep, it's, got, it's got all kinds of symbols on it to give it a good It recovers. That's the nice thing. See, and Newton to, to approach it from a side where it could pick it up. Actually, the hockey stick is kind of weird. They actually have a video of, uh, of uh, these and other tests, and they, they call it the Boston Robotics Tortures Robots. <laughs> okay, he figures out what's happened. And I, I mean, the, the way you do this is that you have a, a standard stand-up routine. And what, you, what he would do if he wasn't face down is he would have rolled until he got to that, that uh, position. And uh, I ain't doing this no more on the... <laughs> Notice they have all kinds of signs so that the robot can figure out what it is. Oh, this one, this one. This is again by uh, Boston uh, Robotics, I think. Which company is this one? I think this is Boston. Still Boston Dynamics? Yeah, no, it's just Boston Dynamics. A and R Source. And this is called the Mastiff. And the military is extremely interested in this because it's basically a big electric mule. So if you look closely, it's carrying backs, packs, and other stuff. And so it's fun. he has a, just a transponder on it and a bunch of whatever it does. And uh, it's just following him. And you can see that it's, it's, uh, it's, so it's, I don't know why it's still from this while I stand still, but that's not my problem. So it just waits for him, and then if he moves again, uh, he'll, it'll follow. Basically, if it gets a certain amount of distance away, it turns toward the other. So that's pretty good. It's it's basically a balanced thing on top of a uh, go. We'll talk about robotics in goal direction. At G O A L. Okay. So we have very good robotics labs here. Professor Beckeris and, and C B I M uh, and a whole bunch of other professors working with him. Doing some really interesting stuff. Yeah. Uh, one of the things you can do, especially as you become like a, a 
sophomore junior is, is trying to hook on with one of these left as uh, a, um, a researcher or assistant or something, and, and you'll get to play with very interesting toys and learn really interesting stuff that looks really good on the resume. On the other hand, you better be both very good at your discrete math and your continuous math. Robots need both, okay? Discrete for how you do specific actions and chunk things the way human thinking chunks things. Continuous because motion is not exactly continuous but almost, right? Controlling it, read traditional calculus, multivariate calculus with all kinds of interesting stuff, approximations that you get in the numerical analysis courses and stuff like that. Okay? So if you're serious about it and just don't want to be a cyber surf doing the lowest level stuff, that's, I never take, heard take the courses here. That's a nice oh, term. Yeah. I like that. Um, we're, we're all going to be cyber surfs unless we know enough. And you guys are in a particularly dangerous position because things have advanced now. It's very easy for people to take advantage. A lot of people, we know that all the time, right? But on the other hand, no, no. you can take advantage of uh, Okay, anybody hear what, what data mining is? Go. Um, you use um, That's not data mining. That's, that's uh, running a Bitcoin pro program. It doesn't count. Go. Well, like, so we use like social media or Facebook or any service that generates a lot of data. You analyze that data and look for trends and uh, make money off of it. <laughs> well, that's make money off of it is okay. But I mean, the, the idea is that you, you, you learn things from big piles of data that don't necessarily seem to have anything to do with each other. So, my favorite example so far of data mining, this is April 23rd, 2013. This is the Dow Industrial Average. Wham! Okay. This is a total of about six, seven minutes. Between those two things. Okay, what happened? Well, they were doing data mining on news sources. Okay? Suddenly, breaking two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama is injured. Okay? This is posted from is from the verified AP account. Nobody cracked it. At 107, in less than one minute, the Dow dropped 140 points. Uh, it comes back after about five minutes. February losses are somewhere around $150 billion. So everybody talks about, oh, it's really good that, you know, it, well, we figured out what it was and we came back, it was good. Yeah. Okay, but how could this be used by, for example, the people who do the hacking? Short stories. Right. Don't expect it. Hold on. Okay. What you do is if you know this is going to happen, you buy here. Right. Okay. As soon as it starts to go, you put in a sell order, a buy order. Okay. And you buy on margin, you know, it doesn't matter how you get it, but you, you buy here, Usually you going sell here. They're gambling. Okay? And this is, you can make billions. Billions in six, six, six minutes. Okay? So the question is, did these guys do that? No one will tell you. Okay? They say they don't know who did this. They say they don't know why. But it, I think you, that's why. And if you believe it, I'll buy you the next election. Natural language, we've already talked about. Uh, now, my example of this is Watson. Everybody remember Watson on Jeopardy? Watson was this computer from IBM that was supposed to be this wondrous thing. I right, have an example of, of... Final Jeopardy category is U.S. cities, and here is the clue. Its largest airport is named for a World War II hero. Its second largest for a World War II battle. 30 seconds, players. Good luck.
We come to you, Ken. You had 2,400 for this final going in, and you wrote down what is Chicago. That is correct, and you wagered $2,400. That doubles your score to 4,800. Down to Brad now. He had 5,400. I have to feel that he came up with a correct response. Did he? Yes, and the wager? Doing almost everything you can. $5,000 takes you up to 10400 Now to our leader, Watson, going into final 36681 And the response was, what is Toronto? Okay. What was the category? U.S. City. U.S. City. Uh -huh. He got Toronto? <laughs> or she, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, we were next Canada already. This is predicting the future. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> So the question is, how could this have possibly come up? Toronto is in, not in a, it's not a U.S. city. It's not in the U.S. How could it come up with Toronto? The answer turns out, it's not in this, this video, but it, it turns out that the, uh, uh, the searching for an answer is very greedy about wh where it goes and looks. And so what happened was the matching of the clue came up with an answer that was Toronto. But, and so it said, well, this must be the answer because here it answers the question. And it never went back and said, is this the right category? So it never, it, it just it just came up with Toronto and said, I got it. And so, so it was a very, it was a very bad algorithm, which works in most cases. In other words, the greedy algorithm of, oh, let's find out, aha, it will probably work. But in this case, it worked like really bad. Oh, and the, the, the thing is, a lot of question marks, which means, of course, that Watson had many, many doubts. And the wager has a lot of Oh, you sneak. It's still one. These, well, yeah. It was the house. But these are, these are all programmers of Watson. And they're all smiling and applauding. Why? That's embarrassing. That's terrible. But it was more embarrassing for Watson to be pulled from uh, the University of Texas hospitals ah, yes. after, what was it, three or four years? Not that oh, was nice. Many, many, I think 150 or 200 million dollars wasted trying to make it do medical diagnosis, treatment, and other things. I work in medical informatics, I have for the last 40 years, and the amount of hype behind Watson, because a lot of our PhD graduates have worked, and one of them still works for IBM. And there's a, been a gradual collapse of IBM as a place doing serious science, and it's pretty much completely gone to just PR, trying to essentially do consulting for companies and get tons of money from other companies without really caring about the science too much. Very sad, very tragic, and rather. So, Similar to what's happened in a number of places in the United States. So, so here's what here's what happens with Watson. Okay, they claim it's doing natural language processing. It really isn't. Okay, it's doing reverse interrogation. Question that answer. Okay, you know Jeopardy, right? Okay, that's not natural language. It's a question. I mean, it's an answer that you have to generate a question for. So that's not English. That's a that's a subset of things in English. The the uh, there was no need for it to parse the actual both spoken voice. Because we've given it as tax, and it was greedy in the database search as seen by that example. So Watson ignored the category because the answer, without the category, presented itself, and it decided, "Well, here's an answer. I'm done." Well, you know, but I mean, when, when we talk uh, about when we get down to the to the, the neural net stuff, that's where we wind up with answers that we don't know if they're right, but it's the best we got. Part of the problem is with the way logic is implemented. In our thinking and modeling, not just the way it's implemented in computers, you get away with binary and Boolean logic in computers because people are clever and having programmed things at the machine level that way and it's very useful. We don't think in terms of two-value logic. Most of the time we're smart enough to know something is true, false, or maybe. And it may be because it's ambiguous, because it's the data is incomplete, all kinds of reasons, right? So the in-between, three-value logic is the minimum that we use. In general, if 
5 value, 10 value, you know, 11 value, some odd number is good. They're called modal logics. The trouble with modal logics is they are very inefficient and hard to compute. And combinatorics explodes. Right, combinatorics so, explode with binary, but even so, more. Yeah, so let's say that we have a question. There are many possible answers. Yes? No. I don't know. I don't care. That's right. I used to know, but I don't anymore. Right? Okay. There's a whole bunch of possibilities that we recognize that is very difficult to get a computer to figure out. In other words, you have to really go into, you have to start modeling our psyches. That's really hard because we don't even understand it at all. In other words, like artificial intelligence is like a human mind. Do we know what the human mind works like? Do we know anything about that? What makes us self-aware and a dog not? I hope. Okay. Or a dog or a cow not aware. Okay. We have no idea. Okay. It used to be they said, well, it's the size of the brain, it must be it. Well then how come you know giant gorillas aren't smarter than us? They got a bigger brain. And then it was, well, it's the number of neurons. And, no, it doesn't work either. Okay. We don't know why. We don't know anything about how we think. You know, the only thing we've learned is with people who've got strokes or brain damage or something like that, we can figure out how they don't work and guess about how they work. So that's one of the other problems with when we get around to talking about techniques, we're trying to model the human human brain doesn't work. And the modeling, right. modeling with neurons, which assumes that all neurons are the same, is wrong. We have tons of different types of neurons, and it's not neurons alone. They're embedded in things called glial astrocyte networks, which give you the biases and the various ways in which the neurons fire. Totally different. You guys are going to be in a totally different ball game once we, and everyone's going to look back at what we're doing today with new so-called neural nets. Love, you say, They're idiots. How do they think that deep learning meant anything except superficial learning to cheat other people? Because we're very clever at cheating other people, right? And that's what they're doing right now. Most of what deep learning that you hear about, a lie. Don't believe it. Okay. Yeah, you know, well, by the way, anybody ever seen those ads for the AWS uh, base stealing thing? Okay, you ever try and try and find the actual answers they give? You can't. They don't tell you. They won't tell you. What they say is, we can determine if someone's going to steal and if they'll make it or not. And then they show this this video of a guy stealing a base, and that's it. You go and look at their website, and there's nothing there. All it says is, we could possibly do this or buy our software. So, so be careful. You know. Okay, so crowd analysis. This is uh, so this is a crowd of people, and they're trying to leave this place. So what we're trying to find out is if these are these exits big enough, and we find that some people wandered off in the wrong direction, and they have to come back, and these people are just sort of you know I don't know where I'm going, and so so but we have so we have to analyze. We have to sorry we have to model all these people's behavior in some way. And one of the things this is really used for is uh, for fire situation. In other words, if there's somebody, if, there's, if this is a fire, we better have enough exits or people are going to die. Right? Because look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven different armies of fire. Okay. So these are, this was supposed to be the, the sort of battle of the five armies from the Hobbit thing. Okay. So. Now we're going to model each of these armies and what they're going to do and see how this affects what goes on in this city. Favorite wargaming kind of thing people have been doing forever and ever with sand and sticks and stuff like that. So well, these guys climb this and they're going to go, okay, they want to fight these guys. So they go over and they fight these guys. Graphics are great. Yeah, aren't they? Yeah. So it's a program called Massive, which I want to see about buying. It really, it really looks interesting. Okay, so what they've done is they've modeled sort of a, a general purpose uh, behavior, that, and then they just put it in a group of 500 and see what happens. I don't know where all this is. All right, so they're fighting away and fighting away. Okay. The University of Pennsylvania. One of the professors started this kind of thing about 30 years ago. 
this is a, it's taken 30 years to get it this way. Okay, so here we have these two groups decided to go into the town, and so we have a bunch of little fights. And, and, and my favorite one at the end, they're fighting. Out of Ah, this is my favorite. Okay. There's this narrow space between this <laughs> building and this cliff. Okay? Now, this group and this group have decided that they are going to get through this place to kill the other guy. They have decided because they really want to kill the other the, the I'm going to kill those guys outweighs everything else. So the elves are... Okay, so here... Look at, look at this pile. <laughs> They're climbing a hill of each other to get to each other and, and, and not uh, obeying any other uh, imperative. Some descriptions like, of ancient battles yeah. are precisely not so It's like, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like climbing a hill and they got down on the other side. Of that. Meanwhile, back here, the guys with the bows are shooting at these guys from behind. And they're just ignoring it because they're busy fighting these guys. Okay, so we're analyzing crowd behavior by, we take each guy and then we sort of wind them up and, and this way we can tell what's going to happen when groups do that. So they all die because they, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the elves back there, they just keep shooting bows. They win because they don't ever close in the fight. There's a, a famous story about uh, Lord of the Rings. Have you, you ever seen the movie Lord of the Rings? Okay. There's a big battle at the very beginning uh, with uh, Africa. Uh, the good guys in the bad guys. And they did this kind of uh, uh, stuff to, to model the game, to model the, uh, the fight, and then they wound them up and let them go. And the problem was is that they wrote in too much self-preservation into the, the individual soldiers. So they, they, they were facing each other, and the first thing they do is both sides of them. Hey, fight pretty crazy. So. But crowd modeling is a very... Um, very, it's a new and very interesting uh, bit of analysis because it's not new in the trials. It's very old, uh, and thirty years at least. Well, yes, but sorry. Well, new, but new is practical in terms of scaling it up. Yes, yeah, I mean, it's been done, but it's done mathematically. Yeah, exactly. okay. So, so here, so what we have to do for crowd behavior: yeah. model individuals, uh, model the environment, put the models together, give them a goal, which might be. Flee a danger, like the room is on fire, I must get out. Uh, observe an event, and sorry, observe an event, like watch a movie, watch a fight. That's very that one's very interesting. Now, what good is uh, is, for example, this and this in say not disaster uh, situations? What what can I do if I can see that there's some people are having a fight? And other people like crowding around to watch it. Like, what, what good does that do? <laughs> um, you would know that um, uh, it might be like two, two like also like two gangs fighting. Okay. So you would know to avoid them. All right, that, that's a reasonable answer. Anybody else? Go. Maybe tell you about the conditions in which a fight might break out. That's another good one. You got one. They're both right. If if instead of having little fit, little stick figures in a game, right, what happens if I have a video camera watching, for example, the concourse of the subway? Okay, and I can and I can figure out not necessarily what they think, but each individual and what they're doing. If I know what a fight looks like, I could say to the local security people, it "Looks like there's a, a, a fight on, in in Carter B," or if I see people all moving in one direction in a, in a way that looks like they're fleeing a danger, I could tell security, looks like there's a fire in Carter 7. Okay? So I could use this to analyze what they're doing and then warn people about what's going on. That's what, that's what this, this kind of crowd behavior is best at. And you can also do, do uh, modeling to figure out how many, uh, when you're building a stadium, how many, how many exits from what levels do you need to do to, to make sure that everybody gets out easily? But diagnosing what is unusual crowd behavior and trying to do something about it, very tough to figure out. 
it's very easy if you have as your goal to stop anything that looks even mildly suspicious it's very easy to overreact to what appears to be criminal or undesirable crowd behavior and that's why many tragedies of history can be described as overreacting or underreacting to crowd Sorry. behaviors mm -hmm. okay Thank you. Elections can be viewed as crowd behavior of a controlled sort, right? Not, no, I'm not so sure. Um, but I think he's, it over. he's the philosophy of the energy. Over. Uh, so targeting, this, this one I have an actual video for. It is crowd behavior. That's why currently, whether or not our electoral machines are being manipulated or not, particularly when you're on the boundary, is such a critical issue. Okay. In other words, have enough of the electronic machines being cleverly put at the disposition of someone with the interest to, for the world to go one way or another. You know what I mean. So do I, and I still say you can't hack a machine that isn't attached to the internet. Well, um, that's the question. Well, that was, oh, the Russians hacked their things, and that's why Trump won. Yeah, right. So this... That's okay, where the temporal model comes in. Yeah. Okay, so they, they reset it and hack it ahead of time. Okay. Targeting, we've heard of uh, cruise missiles, right, that they have, they have so very low. This one was my favorite. 1943, Project Pigeon. About, today's money, about uh, almost half a million dollars. And Project Orcon, organic control. So this was... We don't have artificial intelligence, but there's something that they used to be called dynamic games. This is the second one it was part of that. This this is just the pigeon. We have pigeons, okay, who we can train to peck at something and then give them seeds when they do the right thing. Go. I think I've heard of this one. Is it yeah. where they put the animal in the missile? Yes, like, exactly. Yeah, there you go. yeah. So what they what they mm -hmm. we have coming so this is the idea. Uh, it was the US Navy who they wanted to use it for. So the idea is that you'd have a a glide bomb. So here here they're, they're, they're this is the pigeon. This is an actual pigeon, and they're just showing a movie, but they're showing where it it pecks. And it's doing a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. I mean here far away and getting closer and closer. And it turned out you could get it to uh, try and hit a specific part of the ship. I mean, the, uh, it was one of the early uh, attempts at behavior modification for which they have tried to do humans and it doesn't work very well. But for pigeons, it seemed to work not bad. And, Why do you uh, call them bird brains? Oh, oh, oh. Hey, that was B.F. Skinner who brought that up. It's part of the whole field of cybernetics, which was generated during World War II. Oh, here you go. Uh, and then, and I ran, when I was reading this, I, I ran across Blue Peacock. Now, Blue Pe Peacock was a British plan during the Cold War. They were worried that the Germans, I mean, the Germans, the Russians would just come across the border and overrun everybody. So what they did was they buried hydrogen bombs in the ground. And the idea was that if they did, then they could detonate the hydrogen bombs behind the Russians and come. And it would be, you know, really hard on the population as well, but there you were. And collateral damage. I suppose. Not if you're a German. The problem was that the detonators got to freeze in the cold ground. So what they did was they buried a chicken with the bomb and some seeds. And the detonator was set that if it got too cold, it would go off. So the chicken would keep the heat high enough in around the detonator to like make it not go off. And if the chicken died, the bomb would go off. So every four days, they had to go out and dig up the bomb and put a new chicken in. I, I, was, I, just, I just had to tell you about that. It was so ridiculous. I had it there. No artificial intelligence, in fact. Pretty much not artificial intelligence. Not even any. Okay. And the last one I want to talk about in just passing is medical decision making and medical assistance. Watson was put in charge of diagnos diagnosing, this is the Texas thing he's talking about, diagnosing cancer patients. 
it failed miserably. If, we, if they had followed what Watson said, people would have died in, in, their, in dozens because of this diagnosis. Soon they were going to die anyway. Well, that's right. Well, I mean, you, okay, okay. Anyway. So, so, they, so what he said, they just, they just abandoned the Watson project. Texas said, get it out of here. We don't, it ain't doing us any good. Okay. So what is medical decision making? It is many things. Image analysis. But we have to, when we do image analysis, we have to think about other stuff. We have to think about patient individual characteristics. If we look at an image of a 350-pound, 20-year-old man and a 125-pound, 60-year-old woman, they're going to be different. And if we use what we learned on the 20-year-old man on the 60-year-old woman, we're probably going to kill it. Okay, so we have to be able, when we do image analysis, we have to take individual characteristics into effect. We have to know about pre-existing conditions. Was the person a smoker? Are they still a smoker now? Do they you know, eat bad stuff? Whatever. And previous behavior. Do they drink heavily? Okay. Our image analysis has to be informed by this or we're not going to be able to do any good. Data analysis. We can data at heartbeat, temperature, and behavior. You know, it's like, are they going to the bathroom regularly? But we still have to be cognizant of this stuff. So this turns out to be a really hard problem. Nursing analysis, keep track of uh, what drugs. Uh, my dad was in uh, a uh, uh, nursing home, well, it was a yeah, host hospital, and they were giving him twice as many drugs as he needed for everything. And that was because someone had Xerox, uh, the list of drugs, and put it in his little folder twice by accident. And the nurses, okay, it says right here, so, then you're killed. So, and for also for nursing analysis, alarm condition. And we want to be able to set, tell when the patient is in trouble. In other words, if the nurse can't be there to watch you 24 hours a day, and they can't, we want to be able to have some kind of system that says, this is really bad. Do something now. Okay? And if we have an emergency condition, what kind? Okay, do we have to call in the crash cart and get the paddles out and zap them and so forth? Or do we not? You know, if somebody isn't having a heart condition and we come in and zap them with the paddles, they're going to have a heart condition. Well, that's not a good idea. So if we're going to do medical decision making and assistance, we better be able to do it really well. This is where people die. Okay? And it is one of the most dynamic fields at the moment. Because the, the advantages are huge. If you do it right, it's tremendous. Yeah. If you do it wrong, people the die. big problem is the problem that... The flip side is the so-called opioid epidemic, because patients who are very seriously ill typically are seriously in pain. They need painkillers. If they're about to die as in terminal conditions, they treat you full of morphine. then they need morphine or something to really control them. But because now everyone is panicked that people are taking painkillers unnecessarily, reasons that are, quote, not legitimate, as opposed to because they're dying in horrible pain, then they're holding back. From there, the there's, there are some people yeah. who I've talked to there that the, the hospitals are in, 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 in excruciating pain, and the patients, well, the doctor, doctor, yeah, the hospitals, don't talk about either. hospitals will not give them strong painkillers. Because as they say to someone in agony, you might get hooked. At this, Which is ridiculous. At this time last year, my mother was uh, a few days before she died. She was 95, congestive heart failure, all kinds of things. She was under hospice care, authorized levels of morphine. The nurse didn't, still didn't want to give her the levels of morphine that she needed to control the pain. She was shaking, clutching my hands, and wanted more. Why? One supposes for a variety of reasons, right? Insurance reasons, no nurse wants a patient to die on their uh, watch, you know, all kinds of stuff. But it's not easy, right? We don't have a good measurement of pain. It is completely subjective, completely individual. That's one of the big problems. It's a ter terrible ethical problem. It's a terrible practical problem if you are in pain. The wife of the former chair of our department begged her husband to kill her because she had such pain suffering from consequences of breast cancer. He didn't, 
but the poor woman suffered again for the same reason. It was horrible. She had survived the concentration camp in Hungary during World War II. Anybody who's been in the hospital may ask you the dumbest question in the world. Yeah. What is your pain level from 1 to 10? Right. Okay. If you want the drugs, what do you say? 10. Ten. Even if I don't need them. Hey, give me that morphine. Yeehaw. Okay. Yeah. If you give them an answer, it, you, but you play this game. Okay. I want this pain to go away. Mm -hmm. So I want the drugs. But I don't want you to think I want the drugs. So that you will give them to me because if I want them, you won't give them to me. Yeah. So I have to pick a number that I think you will think that I'm being truthful and you'll give me the drugs. Unfortunately, and, too much of medicine is that way. And so what number is that? I have no idea. But if you say 10, they'll either shoot you up with stuff that puts you out cold, and which you probably don't want, or they'll give you nothing. You know, oh, Tylenol, in fact. So, so if we can do anything with artificial intelligence to make that better, everybody wins. But that's the most hard part of artificial intelligence as it is for humans. Threshold judgments. If you heard lawyers speak and use the expression, that's a threshold issue. They are right on target. Those guys are sharp. In other words, you don't know which way you're going to flip, right? True for everything in medicine, everything in life. It's critical in medicine, it's critical in finance, it's critical in gambling. We all gamble. The question is, do we gamble stupidly or do we gamble uh, you know, in a way it doesn't really bother us? You can waste one buck on an hour. I think it's two dollars now on uh, what you call it. Oh, lottery? Lotteries, yeah. That, that's stupid gamble, right? If you're really lucky, yeah, that's it. Or maybe you're really unlucky. Because no one knows. You might be lucky. No one knows no what, what happened to the money. Giving money to children. I mean, that's, that's a thing that is hard to discuss, but it's part of AI. We have four million years of evolution of humans where most of the time we died at 15 to 30, we were starving all our lives, we were not comfortable. It's only in the last few hundred years for the majority of the population, even the last 20 or 30 years, that we have abundance. That's why we do have an obesity epidemic. That's why we do have a um, opioid epidemic. We don't know how to handle abundance, right? In other words, that turns that, that, you know, that number of it. No. Seven? But if the, if, the, if the nurse or the doctor says seven's high enough, that's still a judgment call. Yep. Based on, I don't know what. Probably they don't know what. That's because they play the same game back at you. Well, did he pick a number too high because he wants the drug? Or did he pick a number not high enough, but high because he thinks I want to know a number that, you know, play that game back and forth. It would be nice if we could have some, you know, if we could say that... We can look at things like, uh, we can do some of this. Look at the heartbeat. Look at the adrenal levels in the blood. In other words, if we could have some way to in, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, discover what the pain really is to the person. Some, in other words, we could analyze the heartbeat, the temperature, you know, what drugs they already have, the, uh, the you know, sweat levels, all that kind of thing. Could we come up with a way to, to figure out pain? without actually asking the person and then playing that number game. And if we could, then everything gets really easy. Because we can say, okay, you, you need Tylenol, you need codeine, you need... Uh, so, because, and then we don't have to put the doctors and the nurses in the position of watching you be in agony because they thought you shouldn't have the drug that you wanted. That's part of the problem of thinking that analysis will solve everything. But we as humans synthesize information and synthesize the feelings of others. Computers are nowhere, our knowledge of ourselves, we're nowhere near being able to figure that one out, okay? That's why it's fairly accurate for me to be able to get away with saying most strong leaders, whether they be in finance, business, politics, religion, you name it, definitely the military, have to be sociopaths or psychopaths or both. Right? They have to not care too much about, not the damage damage about other people. 
you care about people's pain, you're in trouble. That's why President Clinton, when he said, uh, I feel your pain, got widely laughed at. Well, he did. Yeah. That's well, he should. For good reason. No way you that we, there's no way that we can really feel other people's pain. We think we can. Well, I mean, it was. I will. You know, I feel your pain, but I ain't doing anything about it. Thanks a lot. That's nice. Uh, so, just a few things that ain't AI. You probably heard a long time ago. They said, Ah, if we can get a machine to play chess, that's artificial intelligence. So, no, it ain't. Okay, because all it is is uh, a decision tree analysis of every move in the future. In other words, what you do is is you take the, the board now. And you make a, a, a hypothetical move, and then you make a hypothetical counter move by your opponent, and you do that for every possible move, and then you figure out which one is best for you. It's really it's 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 absurdly complex, but also not intelligent. It's a closed world game. Okay. In other words, there, there, nothing nothing untoward can occur. All the moves are 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 discreet, and you can't like move a knight off the board. And then down the hall, and then bring it back in another place. Okay, it's, it's only you, you can if you're a kid and you're cheating, and you know that the adults son can call you on it because they know you're a stupid kid. But that's about the only reason. So uh, expert systems were thought of as artificial intelligence. Um, Charles and I are going to argue. We can argue for because expert systems, what we were just talking about, medicine. <laughs> Is judgment. Well, yes, but I mean, I just. So the judgment the expert system of expert systems of the 70s, definitely is. Of the 70s and 80s. Uh, expert systems were thought of as uh, what you do is you ask an expert. Right. It was originally done for uh, uh, oil uh, drilling. There were these, these uh, uh, folks who had this ability to, they would, uh, if you know how to do uh, soundings, basically they set up a bunch of dynamite on the top of the, uh, on top of the ground and they watch what what uh, reflections come back and what they what they look like. And there were these fellas and women who could look at that graph and say there is oil there and always be right. And nobody knew how they could do it, and they didn't know how they could do it. But they knew. You know, they might have learned something from somebody else and so but but they couldn't tell you exactly what. So what they said was, I'll tell you what, we'll ask them all a whole bunch of questions about a whole bunch of possible things. And we'll sort of bless them all together and we'll develop rules. If this is true and that is true and that is true and that is true, then there's oil there. And that was supposed to be an expert system and it isn't. It's just a big, big data. Well, it's a rule based system and uh, Charles is absolutely right. If you consider expert systems to be fixed, rule based systems with fixed thresholds, then I agree with you 100%. If you consider thresholds on the rules and possibility of learning rules, then it's an, that's basically what we all always do. We try to create rules for everything because they make life simpler. In reality, it doesn't really work. Yeah. And image analysis, that we've talked about image analysis before, but there was a, in, in the past there's been image analysis that tried to do what's called edge detection, and it could tell you if there was a person in the picture, maybe. Or, and that person might actually be you know, a teddy bear. But that's a person because it has it has very you know it has two eyes and a nose. Hey, it must be a person. Brain can analog. I, can I be picky, Charles? You may. Instead of in this image analysis, we can do what we can't do is image understanding. All right, all right. Better word. Sorry. The word understanding, and the same thing applies to expert systems. We don't know what it means to understand anything, right? You guys are in college for nothing, right? What? We're supposed to be improving our understanding, but we don't know what understanding means. So we're going to be testing you with all kinds of uh, crazy tests, most of which are supposed to not test us, you. Not us, but people at the university. Me, I'm playing myself and the other professors, right? With, uh, that's why educational <laughs> testing service and admitting people based strictly on uh, your scores on tests, yeah, it sort of works, but only because it sort of works. It's not really It right. works because we all agree that, that's, that it's a good, good uh, criteria. It's it efficient. It, it makes it cheaper for colleges to process you. It really doesn't figure out whether you understand stuff. In fact, some of the more intelligent people in my family do worse than me, who's a less intelligent person in my family, because they do, even though they do worse on standardized tests. They think of too many options. I learned early in life, growing up in South America, under a dictatorship, 
you tell people what they want to hear. And I, I developed a clever way of figuring out pattern recognition, of telling people what they want to hear. If you're too free and too open, you get yourself into trouble. Well, the, the most interesting case of that, to me, was the election of 2016. You might remember that pretty much everybody before the election said Clinton was going to win based on poll data. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that people lied to the poll. They told the pollsters what they thought the pollsters wanted to hear. Absolutely. And the pollsters just believed it. So if you wanted to vote for Trump, you didn't want the pollster, because you didn't know who that pollster really worked for. It might be working for the, for the Clinton campaign. You would tell them, oh, no, I'm going to vote for Clinton, even though you weren't. So, so the, the polling, that's the problem with all polling, is it assumes everybody's telling the truth. And us being polled, we don't care. We can lie. Who's, who are they? I do that all the time. It's a game. They call you're me up and they say, you're you're know, what do you think about so-and-so? And I'll say something really ridiculous. And they'll say, okay. I enjoy it. You know, it's like, like you know, playing with you. Uh, for honest, we're honest, right? The first, the well, the first, only rule, the first rule of rule-based systems is you break the rule. Right? But I mean, the only polling that actually was true was the vote. Mm -hmm. Everything else the predicted, I mean, if you watched MSNBC, Clinton was going to win by Quite a bit. more votes than existed in the world. Oh. But, you know. No, 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 let's not get carried away. No, no, I'll get carried away. I like it. Uh, okay, and the last one is brain analog. There was a, there was a, a, a long stretch which uh, became neural nets, which said, what we'll do is we'll model the brain. It'll be great. We'll do what the brain does, and we'll be able to be and as intelligent as a human being. And the problem is we don't know how the brain works. We still don't. We have some ideas, but we can't model them in any way. In other words, can I tell from looking at you, from looking at your brain, let's say I, can, I scan your brain, could I know that you were more intelligent than him? Or that he was more intelligent than me? No. No idea. There's no, there's no way to by know what, By what criteria? Because it's all mediated by consciousness. <laughs> or could I say that you can play a video game better than he could play a video game because you think faster? No. Okay, because we don't have we have no idea why that happened. So all the all the things that went to well we'll do what the brain does, which includes neural nets for the most part, but not all. But no. Are are uh, I did it. So that's not a that's a simple Simple diagram of a very complicated thing we all carry up here. We don't really know yeah. how it works. Uh, for example, uh, there's uh, there's significant evidence that if you have a stroke, your brain will rewire itself. Okay, nobody knows how that happens. Nobody knows why it happens. Why doesn't it happen to somebody who hasn't had a stroke? There have been people who have significant portions of their brain removed for one reason or another, and they continue as if they were as before. Somehow, we have no idea why. And so if we don't have any idea how the brain works, how can we ever use it as an analog for anything? But there are people who claim that they did, and they were wrong. This guy uh, is doing a lot of good work. We is, a lot of it is quite readable. You should get to the point where you actually enjoy reading Kandel's writing. You can watch him. I don't know if he's got a TED, but he, he's, on, he's got tons of things online by him. Listen to him. We'll see about uh, that guy. Put some of the links to some of the stuff on you. Yeah. Four minutes. Right? Yeah. Four minutes to go? Thereabouts, yeah. I'm, I'm going as fast as I can. There we go. Okay. So, quick the difference between real time and offline AI real time says we have to do it right now, which means we're going to be less, we can't do a lot of planning, essentially. Versus offline means that we can just be as, go as slowly as we have to. And we can go down blind alleys. With the real time, we have to give an answer right away. That's like a robot. If my foot slides, I better have an answer already available or really close, or else I'm just going to fall over. Okay. So there, there turn out to be two different ways of doing things in, uh, in that way. One is better than the other. What sort of input would a crowd analysis and control effect? Video, for the most part. Because what you want to be able to do is see what's going on and see how it changes. And then you analyze the change. So you have to think about when you're doing an AI system, you have to think about what your inputs are. You know, how, how much can you believe your inputs? And the dreaded product is a mostly a thought exercise. That is, if we give you a dictionary and give you, for example, uh, if you look in there, okay, this is the text. That's the. Okay. 535 years ago, fly the Atlantic. Okay. 